Hi, I'm Agnieszka Jaworska from University of California, Riverside. I'm Jeff Seidman from Vassar College. And we're talking uh, with uh, Catherine Rankin, who is a neuropsychologist, and uh, William Seeley, who is a neurologist, both associate professors at the Department of Neurology at the University of California, San Francisco. Um, our topic now is uh, Alzheimer's disease. It's a familiar disease to many people, but mm, we should still explain the basic symptoms. Well, Alzheimer's disease, as you mentioned, is familiar to many. Um, it is the most common cause of uh, dementia in the elderly, and uh, also a common cause of dementia in, in uh, middle age. But uh, the disease begins in the typical patient with a loss of uh, what we call epi episodic memory, or a memory for events specific in time and place, uh, typically progressing to deficits in uh, language, physio-spatial processing, and then later uh, what we call executive functions like organizing, um, prioritizing, and, and uh, carrying out um, a complex uh, action plan. What's your understanding of the anatomy that corresponds to these losses? Well, the early involvement of episodic memory uh, relates to damage to the memory-making structures in the medial part of what we call the temporal lobe of the brain. These are uh, regions referred to as the endorhinal cortex and the hippocampus. Uh, they develop what are called uh, neurofibrillary tangles during the very early, even preclinical stages of the disease. Um, at a slightly later stage, um, those neurofibrillary tangles spread into areas in the posterior parietal and temporal lobes of the brain that are responsible for language and spatial processing. And then only later does the disease progress forward toward lateral frontal areas that are important for executive functioning. And it's important to point out that um, we think that the neuropathological um, changes that I just mentioned uh, precede the clinical deficits by years to decades. Uh, so there's a, there's a period when the pathology is accumulating but no symptoms have, have yet uh, arisen, then there's a period, a, a prodromal phase, where mild uh, symptoms that we often refer to uh, as mild cognitive impairment um, might emerge, and then only later, once multiple domains of, of functioning are impaired, uh, do we refer uh, to the clinical problem as a dementia. One of the things that we found about Alzheimer's disease, when we think about uh, the way that the brain is organized normally, uh, there are anatomically distant structures in the brain that uh, seem to activate and deactivate together. They tend to work together as a team. We call these intrinsically connected networks. And the network that is differentially impacted in Alzheimer's disease, at least typical Alzheimer's disease from the, from the beginning, is a network that we would call, uh, that's traditionally been called the default mode network. Um, sometimes people call it the memory network because it involves, as, as Dr. Seeley's been saying, uh, it involves medial temporal structures like the hippocampus, which helps with memory. It also involves uh, dorsolateral parietal and medial uh, frontal structures that are all involved in uh, being able to evoke memories and really we almost call it, sometimes we call it the time travel network because it helps uh, you to uh, move out of the present and think about, project into the future what could happen, uh, project into the past, think about what has happened, uh, and even uh, maybe be creative and imagine uh, different variations of past or future. So that's differentially affected in Alzheimer's disease from the start before other networks become affected. And though there are a lot of different variations of Alzheimer's disease, folks get uh, slightly different patterns of damage. So uh, there's, there is a typical form, but there are a lot of atypical variants that we recognize. There is almost always damage to the default mode network. Um, the salience network in Alzheimer's patients seems to be hyperactive. So it's almost the opposite pattern of what we see in front of temporal dementia patients for whom this network connectivity is diminished as a part of the disease. And the hyperactivity in the salience network of, uh, in Alzheimer's disease, that's a relatively new finding. Uh, and I think that the behavioral relevance of it is just becoming 
apparent to us. Uh, some of the more recent studies are suggesting that uh, this hyperactivity in the salience network is creating a, a, a greater sense of anxiety in uh, Alzheimer's patients. And that this sense of anxiety, this, this greater agitation and reactivity can be detected as early as the mild cognitive impairment stage of Alzheimer's, which is a stage where the person is not, they're not considered demented, they're perfectly capable of carrying out a lot of their daily activities independently, uh, but they're just having a little bit of cognitive, you know, they're maybe not remembering things the way they used to, uh, and, and things just aren't going as smoothly, and they're just starting to realize that, that there may be a deficit there. At that phase, we often can see an increase in anxiety and reactivity uh, in an emotional and social setting. And one of the interesting things about um, a default mode network is that um, it was discovered in the context of uh, the, the time it was spending uh, not active. So um, as the name kind of suggests, um, it's uh, turned off by most of the things that we ask experimental subjects to do in a, in a PET or fMRI scanner. Um, a different set of brain regions comes on, the default mode network goes off, and then when the task is over, the default mode network comes back uh, to a higher level of, of kind of idling or activity. And so this dynamic interplay between large-scale networks uh, in the brain is a, a subject that's just beginning to be explored and that we think may have some uh, implications for how we understand uh, changes in brain network activity in uh, patients with neurodegenerative disease. And what's so funny is even though these patients in the task-based fMRI studies uh, when they were not doing the task they were asked to do, say they were asked to push a button, read a you know, paragraph, look at a picture, when they weren't doing that, the default mode network would turn on, and people said, oh, that means that's the resting network. They often called it the resting state network, which has sort of gone out of, out of style. But what we realized is that actually they were doing something. What this network does when it's active is it allows you to sort of uh, reminisce and meander. What we do when we're, we're sitting and not don't have anything else engaging our brains is we tend to engage in this time travel in a very unstructured and, and sort of spontaneous way. We just we think about whatever comes to our minds about you know maybe something that happened yesterday or oh I need to remember to do that, to do that or you know oh I, I feel good about this thing that just happened. You know those are the the sorts of content of the default mode network when it's activated. Uh, and we tend to, to use it to look at the contents of our brain. We're not using it to understand our external environment or process inputs into our environment, our, into our brain from the environment. We're actually uh, focusing on our internal content. And because of this, uh, we started to realize that uh, this network actually becomes active when we're doing tasks that involve actively thinking about ourselves or actively thinking about other people. So this network activates when we are uh, doing moral reasoning that involves thinking about the impact of our behavior on other people, personal moral reasoning. Uh, it also activates during a lot of tasks where you're thinking about what another person might think or feel, uh, such as theory of mind types of tasks, particularly emotional theory of mind tasks. It seems to activate also during certain aspects of empathic perspective taking. Uh, and so this network seems to be uh, actively engaged in the process of understanding and thinking about self and other. Given what you said um, about the, the pattern of damage in Alzheimer's disease, do you think it, it's useful to think of Alzheimer's patients as sort of lacking temporally extended agency at all, or are aspects of that preserved? Yeah, one of the things, as, as Dr. Seeley was saying, Alzheimer's patients lose the ability to lay down new memories. And so what ends up happening is they will not, as the disease progresses, they will not have memories of the recent past because they didn't lay down those memories as the disease was active in their brains. And so they are experiencing their current self uh, at any one time. And maybe they are uh, aware of that current self in that moment, but then in an hour, in a day, they won't be able to remember what that self was. So they are bad at extending their self into the recent past, though memories that were laid down uh, a long time ago 
they are able to access, and they are and they're often spending time uh, accessing those memories and, and kind of uh, being in that state. One of the things that's um, an interesting uh, point here is that the default mode network actually uh, this the most anterior part of the default mode network is the part that is doing the most time traveling, just to, to make it simple. And that part of the network is not as damaged in Alzheimer's patients. And so even though they, the rest of the memory system could be damaged in this network, there's still uh, the ability to sort of go back in time. However, they're bad, especially as the disease progresses, at knowing where they are in time. So locating the fact that, yes, this is my current self today, this was my self yesterday, this was my self 20 years ago, it's not as linear anymore. And so sometimes what we see in our patients is that they will not understand that they're 87 and sitting in a doctor's office and they live in California now. They will think that they're, they're 60 and they're, you know, their children are young and they will think that they're living in New York. And they really are not aware of themselves in time. Uh, and in terms of them, their ability to project into the future, that is a little bit degraded as well. They are not able to, when you ask them about their plans for the future and, and get into detail, what, uh, what limited research has been done with this, we don't get the sense that they have very detailed, elaborated ideas of themselves in the future. Uh, so, so there is a difference in the way an Alzheimer's patient thinks of themselves longitudinally. I think um, I, w I would also say, and I'm sure that uh, Dr. Rankin would agree, that most patients with Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's disease understand that they have a future, um, but the, the richness with which they can imagine that future is, is uh, diminished. And um, in terms of other aspects of their extended self over time, I think that often the patients, at least in the early to middle stages of the disease, retain um, core um, understanding about of the kind of person that they are and wish to be. Do they have concern about the future, even if they don't, cannot plan and think about it in detail, are they I would minimally say, projecting themselves into the future with concern? Right. I mean, I think in the early stages of the illness, um, concern about the future would be the rule. Uh, there are exceptions, um, like uh, there are to any rule, but most patients in my office uh, are concerned about what lies ahead for them. They're concerned about how their disease will progress, the impact it will have on their family, um, the way that it will, the sadness that will be experienced by their spouse when they're gone. Uh, they articulate these things with great anxiety and worry. And uh, well, I think uh, that can change over time, but early on uh, that's a major component of what um, I'm trying to do as a clinician is to um, help uh, address those concerns, um, mitigate them, th give them you know, alternative ways of thinking, and then help their caregiver uh, learn strategies for um, addressing those concerns, which can, all, which can all often be the, the main content of a uh, moment-to-moment -moment mental life. Given the focus of our project, we're, we're interested in um, the capacities that are preserved in Alzheimer's, and specifically the possibility that the capacity to care and love might be preserved at least uh, for longer than one might expect given the other deficits of, of this disease. So could you speak to that issue a little bit? We actually have evidence from uh, at least two uh, lines of investigation about this that, that Alzheimer's patients really do have a preservation of these abilities. First is just our observations. Anybody who, who has sat with somebody who has Alzheimer's or you know, beginning phases, middle phases, there's a sense that that person is the same person they used to be, they just have diminished cognitive abilities. They might not remember the way they used to, or they might not understand language the way they used to. Maybe they can't find their car or get lost in a, a certain space, but that doesn't change their personality. They seem like the same person. Uh, their, their ability to read the emotions of the person in the room seems the same. They're, they're, they're tracking with you. They're paying attention to, to your feelings and they're, they're feeling concerned when there's something wrong. All those things are, are very clear to us. Anybody who's spent time with Alzheimer's patients, that's, that's all obvious. But there's also a, a large body of research that suggests that the structures that are involved in social and emotional functioning are really often, are typically spared in Alzheimer's disease. There are certainly exceptions because this disease has a great diversity on an individual level. However, we see that the structures that are supporting their ability to connect 
remain intact very late in the disease. The, um, the interesting thing anatomically about uh, particularly emotional connection and emotional uh, responding and, and perception is that these are very phylogenetically ancient abilities. We've been able to do this long before our cortexes developed to the degree of complexity that they're currently developed. We actually use some cortical parts of our brain to do things like read emotions. Um, there are case studies where somebody who has no, they're basically cortically blind because the occipital lobe of the brain has been so damaged that they really can't see. There are certain individuals where you, you can put a picture of a face in front of this cortically blind person and ask them what emotion the person is showing and they accurately identify the emotion. So their cortex is not seeing, but there are elements, very phylogenetically ancient elements of their brains that are still seeing the emotions. And that's what we think is happening with Alzheimer's disease. So even though lots and lots of cortical areas are being damaged that support their ability to, to pick apart the details of what another person is saying and thinking and uh, what their facial expression means, there are very ancient structures that are preserved that are really helping them to, in the room, in reality, read and be sensitive to and responsive to those, to those emotions and, and to experience those emotions on the same level that they've always experienced them. And as Dr. Rankin alluded to earlier, um, uh, we have some reasons to hypothesize that these social and emotional um, capacities may not only be um, preserved in some patients, but may even be better than they had been previously in those same patients, and better than a lot of their um, age-matched peers. Um, and I think that, that's, that that idea really starts in the exam room, where you see the patient constantly looking for information from uh, the other people in the room making eye contact with their loved ones, often as a way of trying to um, obtain reassurance about um, uh, the topic of the conversation, but also just because their brains, I think, hunger for social connection and uh, can make great use of that kind of information. Um, so uh, caregivers will often report that the person is uh, just as sweet and loving as they had been before, highly attuned to them. Um, I've had caregivers maintain that view all the way into the latest possible stages where the patient can no longer speak, can no longer recognize the, the loved one uh, convincingly, certainly cannot name uh, the spouse at this stage, and yet the spouse says to me, uh, he, he, he's still there, he's still the same person, I can tell it's him. So it starts in the clinic and then um, it's really rather extraordinary and then um, in part based on some of these um, network level um, dynamic interactions that we were speaking about a moment ago, uh, we suspected that the, the network, which we call the salience network, which is uh, critical in social and emotional uh, processing, might actually be enhanced in, in patients with Alzheimer's disease and when we um, when we did a study on this, that's exactly what we found when we compared the, the connections within that system uh, in Alzheimer's disease to a group of uh, age-matched uh, healthy uh, controls, we found that the Alzheimer's disease network was actually stronger and, um, and that finding has been uh, now uh, seen in a series of subsequent studies um, that really say to me that the capacity to care uh, the capacity to connect and the capacity to feel uh, in a social context is at least as good as normal. Um, you study these disorders together, the behavior variant of frontotemporal dementia and Alzheimer's disease. Uh, could you speak to, is it helpful to do this together in terms of, does it give you a greater understanding to compare and contrast these two? disorders? What can we learn from that? I do a lot of work where I am studying behavior. As a neuropsychologist, one of the things that, that I want to do is I want to characterize people's social and emotional behavior, their, their processing, their experiences uh, as clearly as I can, in addition to all the, the traditional aspects, you know, memory, uh, executive function, language, all those things. And I, I think that it's actually extremely helpful for me as a scientist to, to always look at 
how people function on the same test and who have behavioral variant FTD and who have Alzheimer's disease. And they often function in a very opposite way. Not always. Sometimes the same deficits appear in both. But, but really, uh, in the social and emotional domain, that's where I see a huge contrast. Because the patients that, uh, you know, they, Alzheimer's patients can often be very uh, impaired on traditional cognitive tests. They might be what we would consider moderately demented. They can't remember something five minutes after you tell it to them, and they really couldn't organize themselves to cook dinner or drive a car, but uh, they are able to read the emotions in the videos that I show them. They're able to interpret the meaning of things that I, uh, complex social interactions that I show them. Uh, they're able to uh, produce emotions that are the correct emotion for the situation. And the front and temporal dementia patients, uh, despite the fact that they could drive a car and could cook dinner and really can remember things that happened five months ago, uh, are unable to read those same uh, emotional signals and, and read those emotions and understand the, the social settings that I'm showing them uh, in the tests. And so, so it really provides a, a nice contrast for uh, for the behavior, and I think that also uh, reflects the underlying divergence in the anatomy where Alzheimer's and FTD are almost opposite of each other in the way that they affect the brain. In fact, I'm always uh, approaching um, Kate and her colleagues who have really uh, pioneered the study of social behavior in, in the dementias and asking them, well, I don't, I don't want to know just, you know, uh, a behavior that's uh, different in the two. I want to know a behavior where the patients go in opposite directions from a control group with the control group in the middle mm -hmm. because that's the pattern we see when we use brain imaging and network imaging approaches. We see the two groups going in opposite directions from the, con the healthy uh, controls. And so those are the social tasks, uh, the emotional tasks where Kate and I really get excited and say, well, this is where we have an opportunity to learn about what those networks are doing because we have a parallel um, going on in the behavior and the, and the brain. Um, so those are, those are the opportunities that really um, bring this area to life. And, and to say a little bit more about that, the, the tasks out of all of the battery tests that I give where we see that divergence, where uh, relative to normal uh, FTDs uh, get worse and Alzheimer's get better, uh, or vice versa, one of them is uh, what we call the behavioral inhibition uh, aspect of behavior. So, the, we all have a tendency, to a certain degree, to be aware of what other people think of us and be sort of looking out for errors. Like, we don't want to offend anybody, we feel embarrassed when we make a mistake. Uh, some people feel extremely much this way, they just are very concerned about uh, how they're presenting themselves, comporting themselves socially uh, and behaviorally. They want to just put their best foot forward. And they spend a good amount of energy and actually have some anxiety around that. Uh, whereas others really are just like, whatever, it's going to be the way it is, you know, <laughs> no problem. And what we see is that uh, relative to normal, FTD patients lose this uh, behavioral inhibition. They lose this, what we would consider self-consciousness uh, and anxiety over them, their own behavior, whereas Alzheimer's patients have an increase of that. They become more self-conscious and more uh, worried about how they're doing when we test them and uh, agitated about having made a mistake and what that mistake might mean. And so that's one of the areas that we really see that, that nice divergence. In Alzheimer's disease, do you see cases where people develop new interests or new cares as a result of the disease the way you describe that in BVFTD? Well, I have one or two. Yeah. Yeah, you, you probably have also, but um, uh, I think um, as we mentioned, often a spouse will say to us, well, you know, it's as if she's still there, or maybe they'll say um, she's even sweeter or more, more caring, more sensitive. Um, I had one patient who, even a few years before she had her first symptoms of Alzheimer's disease, um, took a greater interest in the social realm and in fact, changed careers as a result of it. She had been in, um, in a scientific discipline um, and worked primarily in a laboratory and then uh, transitioned into a socially oriented helping profession. Um, and uh, it really struck me because a few years after that career change, she started to have the 
um, uh, symptoms and signs that led me to make a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. Um, and so I always think about her when I think about your question, and, and um, I imagine uh, uh, that, that her internal landscape changed during those years anticipating her illness, and that um, as her uh, salience network was becoming more um, vital, uh, maybe a little bit more uh, activated and connected, uh, she was uh, more drawn into uh, social uh, con into the social domain and, and felt that that was the best use of her skills. And she articulated it in exactly that way. She said, I felt like that was what I should be doing because that was what I was best at. If we think of um, the, the salience network as you know, detecting importance, um, uh, then wh why is it particularly focused on the on the social domain? So why in, in this case do you think her uh, previous profession didn't become more important versus changing the profession? I, I think you're putting your finger on a deep mystery and in, in another way of asking the same question you might say well why in the early stages of behavioral variant frontotemporal dementia are the deficits so social as opposed to being across all aspects of um, responding to important cues in the environment. So um, I think uh, we don't know. I think this is a deep mystery. And I, I think it's something that um, Kate and I are starting to think about more and more. One, one hypothesis would, might be that um, in our human brains, which are, have evolved in a, in a very dynamic social uh, context uh, and niche, uh, the system has been specialized uh, for social information, which is highly uh, varied, uh, enormous data sets we deal with now socially, uh, and things move very fast. So it takes a very special system, able to, to shift gears and adapt uh, online in a rapid way. And it may be that, um, although the, the salience network um, is still responsible for dealing with uh, more primitive kinds of uh, emotionally uh, significant stimuli like pain, hunger, and thirst, that the social domain is what the, the system is most specialized for and that um, its capacity to respond to social situations is most brittle as a result of that. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that, uh, it, it really is a mystery, but one of the things that you said uh, was that the network is engaging uh, us to pay attention to what's important and I think just to even further refine that, it's engaging us to pay attention to what is personally relevant. And I think that's key. I think that, you know, when you look at somebody who's in a scientific discipline and, you know, switches to uh, a more social service sort of discipline, and you want to imagine the internal landscape of that decision, you have to imagine that I really do believe people are hardwired to value connection with others, to value other people's experience and, and derive just an intrinsic reward from that. I think not everyone is hardwired that way, but I think we have a, a, a capacity for that. And it has a lot of individual differences across our population, but I think that somebody who is experiencing a, a heightening of the salience network that would help them to see that something is personally relevant might be more drawn to something with people, that that is more personally relevant to them than this uh, intellectual pursuit that would be almost like a game to play that really wouldn't necessarily feel like it had personal impact and importance and richness. And I, I do think that we are more attuned to others and emotional uh, landscapes because they are more rich in that way. One other just tiny bit of um, amplification of, the, of, of Kate's point uh, and maybe uh, an even less uh, proven or consensus idea. So as, as you mentioned, uh, there's a, a normative curve for uh, social functioning and for presumably salience network um, efficiency or functioning. And um, it might be that the patient with Alzheimer's disease who starts out uh, with a little bit lower than average social functioning uh, and then has an amplification of that network function might be in sort of a sweet spot um, for um, social behavior. Whereas someone who was already um, at the top of their game socially and then got pushed further into network 
activity, well, for them it might be almost too much, and and that in that scenario you could imagine um, the amplification of the salience network's activity resulting in anxiety and distress as opposed to social grace and social sensitivity. So that's a model, not a not a fact, um, but it's a model that I'm interested in pursuing. Though Dr. Seeley has shown that high levels of uh, science network connectivity do correlate directly with other people's reports of the person's anxiety level. So it does seem to map, high levels of connectivity do seem to map onto greater anxiety, which makes sense if you think about what the network is doing. It's helping us identify things as personally relevant and important, and if we see too many things in our environment, too many maybe innocuous things in our environment as being personally relevant and important and maybe having survival value, that's the phenotype of anxiety. That's what anxiety looks like. We're, we're, we're just too attuned to too many things that really we should just be relaxed about. So we talked about um, the benefits of looking at um, several disorders simultaneously, like uh, the two dimensions that you study or uh, perhaps comparing um, psychopathy to uh, frontotemporal dementia and so on. Uh, I'm wondering how do you see the benefits of broader inter interdisciplinary exchange such as this retreat we have had here? I have to say this has been really valuable for me. Uh, this is not my, my first interaction with, uh, with you philosophers, but I, I think that over the course of our interactions discussing uh, the, the general topic of caring, uh, our discussions have forced me to think in a more precise way about what exactly do we mean by caring? How do the brain uh, networks that we're looking at support the construct of caring? How can we elaborate that construct in a really more precise and perhaps operationalized way so that we can actually study that and really get uh, data that supports uh, our conceptualization of caring. And, and more importantly, for me specifically, uh, obviously we've, we've been looking at the salience network for a long time because we have these frontotemporal dementia patients who have damage there, but some of the diseases we haven't been talking about affect other networks that I think are related to emotion uh, reading and, and putting context into our interpretations of the social environment, all those things. Uh, in discussing the, in doing these interdisciplinary discussions, I've realized we need to understand this better. This is actually a, a, a meaningful pursuit for my scientific uh, line of investigation to, to really try to delineate how much uh, of our caring about things is just finding, having, having an increased attention to them and how much of it is actually um, an additional set of rich context. Uh, the, and what exactly is our, our brains doing to add that context and interpret it and apply it? And, and that's obviously a very complex question, and yet I do think that, oh, the other thing that's happened is that uh, folks that, as we've discussed these things, folks have come up with really great questions, really clarifying questions that I can investigate. And I can go back to the lab and I can put people in the scanner and actually figure some of these things out. And so that's, it's just really productive for me. Um, it's one thing to talk to other neuroscientists. We all kind of, you know, think in our box. But when we talk to, uh, when we've talked to the philosophers, it's like you guys have a very clear way of conceptualizing the problems and the gaps in knowledge. And it, it really supports my ability to do my science and do good research design. Yeah, I, I've enjoyed this greatly. Um, when... Um, I start on a project of trying to think about and reflect upon what a given brain system might be there to do. I usually start with uh, trying to carve out a common sense description of what's wrong when that network is broken. And for this particular network, the salience network, which I've been thinking about for a long time, uh, my common sense view is that it it's da that damage to that network um, impaired the ability to care about things. And so when I found out that you uh, were interested as philosophers in the whole construct of caring, um, you know, it, it lit my world on fire. I thought, well, here's a whole group of people who are spending all their time just trying to define what caring is. And what a wonderful compliment that is to the kind of thinking we're trying to do in neuroscience about um, the component processes uh, of a, a common sense definition 
and how they're instantiated in the brain and how the brain performs those operations. Uh, so for me, this has been a, a really um, uh, rich opportunity to refine those definitions and think about um, the constructs with greater um, care. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much.